Hi. What's going on everyone? Aaron here with Dose of Sobriety. So today I want to tell you my uh, sobriety story. Everyone's story is different and I want to tell you how mine began, my failures right after, and uh, the success I had after. But before that, you know, they say when you start using drugs, when you become an addict, that you mentally stop growing and you, uh, you know, you stop doing productive things. And I, I became an addict at 19, and I do believe that I mentally stopped growing at that age. And when I got clean, I realized that I didn't know who I was because I had never evolved into a person. Uh, at least not a person of productivity or any positivity. So this is our garden. Um, mine and my wife Vicky's, who's behind the camera. This is my first garden. Uh, she has had a garden a long time ago, but you can pretty much say it's our first one. You can see all the different vegetables we have. The only thing we've harvested so far is spinach and lettuce, but um, I'm waiting for you know the cucumbers, tomatoes, peppers, Brussels sprouts. Those are the things I'm excited for. Um, you know, once you bring those, once you harvest them and you bring them into the house, you know, I can only imagine that it's just an extremely uh, great feeling. These were seedlings. We didn't go buy these and uh, transplant them. We planted these seeds and uh, we wanted to do it ourselves from beginning to end. So this is just one of the things, an example of reinventing yourself and becoming the person, you know, that you, sh you should have been or that you know you wanted to be and then you know once you got in your sobriety you were able to grow into that so for the rest of the story we'll come over here I'm gonna have a seat is it too loud because of that probably never mind we'll come over here in the back where it's quiet So, uh, my sobriety story is going to start around uh, Christmas time of 2017, coming into the holidays. Now, coming into the holidays of 2017, my, uh, my depression, anxiety, uh, my feelings of just being useless, of failure, and just basically feelings of inadequacy to the world were at their highest ever. Um, at this time, I felt like I had no more life left in me, definitely no fight in me, and I felt like it was all coming to an end. Not in a good way, um, as in I was gonna be getting sober or clean, and it end as in I felt like the end was near of life. Whether it was gonna be self-induced, um, accidental, you know, I, I didn't know, I just felt like that's where I was at. And when you're that low, you don't really care, you know, and I'm not going to say you're excited for it, but you're just ready for it. And I didn't want things to be that way, but that's the way they were. And on December 26th of 2017, I would be arrested again. Uh, for felony charges of a violent nature. It happened in our own home, and this wasn't the first, second, who knows how many times, and to make matters worse, I had multiple violent crimes before this. So I was walking into a very unpleasant situation. Um, I knew my freedom at this point was gone. I didn't know for how many years, but I knew a change was definitely on the horizon. My, uh, my first week in jail was spent being very bitter. Um, and I had been arrested time and time again before this, but this was just a little bit different. Um, I, I used to think I was cool, I was a gangster, whatever. Uh, going in and out of jail was mainly bragging rights. You know, this time, like I said, I was bitter about it. I was mad. Um, I was going through withdrawal. I was homesick. You know, a 
lot of things was going on, our relationship was up in the air. Um, and I was on my way to prison. And I don't know if, you know, if you're watching this, if you've been to prison, not been to prison, jail, whatever, you know, it, it's definitely a hard road to be on. And um, so, yeah, you know, after my first week, that bitterness feeling kind of went away. And I just started prepping myself um, to be going to prison. Now, after that, when I started going to court, this is when I kind of started opening my eyes to a different future. Um, I once again found myself in a room wearing an orange jumpsuit uh, shackled to the floor, shackled to a metal D-ring on a floor with my lawyer on one side, a prosecutor and a supervisor on the other, and there I was in my early 30s bargaining away life of my years or years of my life rather I'm sorry and um, it, you know the depression um, the anxiety everything was you know top level at that point no medical attention no nothing um, thankfully you know my wife was taking care of me as far as um, you know financially while I was inside uh, moral support while I was inside I knew no how many I knew no how many it didn't matter how many years I was going to do that we were going to remain together uh, you know we had reassured each other of that but doing time it, it just you know I, I knew a rough road you know was coming and they tell you they want to rehabilitate you that's not the fact okay because if they cared about rehabilitating you they would have cared that I was mentally unstable, that I was suicidal, um, that I was depressed, that I was in pain, that I needed help, that prior to being arrested, I was attempting to receive help. But rehabilitation is not on the mind of the people who run the system. Okay, the income from the slavery that they are putting people in in the system is the only thing they care about. So going through this process, you know, was rough this time. It was the first time it was rough. Uh, the other times, you know, I really didn't care. Like I said, it was bragging rights to your buddies. So uh, I began going to court, speaking with my lawyer. And um, during one court appearance, after about two months in jail, um, I get into not the chambers but you know like the interview room behind the court and he said hey I'm gonna be getting you out today he said I'm not you're not getting out because of anything I did or because of your case you're getting out because of the number of violent crimes that have come into the jail and now room is of the is of the essence and you're lower on the totem pole this is just sheer luck that you're getting out and he said I want you to leave here knowing that in due time when you come back, you know, you are you will be um, returning to confinement and you will be sent to prison. There's nothing I can do about it. You know, and I, and I didn't look at it like, oh, this lawyer doesn't know what he's doing. I, you know, I just looked at it like, um, this is karma. This is what it is. You know, it's time to uh, finish paying for my sins, basically. And, um, you know, the, the prosecutor made a few offers. Uh, three years was the first offer in which I laughed at her and told her I was this trial uh, before I would take her three years. Like I said, she didn't know me, the situation. She didn't know the truth. All she knew was that it was better for her for me to go to prison. And I, you know, I wasn't for that. I rather have went to trial and lost rather than uh, helping her, you know, by putting myself in prison. What? Bug on your leg. Oh, I have a bug on my leg. <laughs> so, I did get released that day, and uh, we neglected the, the plea deals. And then they did offer one that was sufficient, which would be nine months, only seven left to serve. 
I told my lawyer you want to take that. We would come back to court to accept it and sign for it. And then I would come back on a separate day to turn myself in um, to begin my seven month sentences, sentence where I would be uh, sentenced to LCC for the remainder of my time. <clears throat> and when I came back to get sentenced, everything changed. Uh, instead, I would be sentenced to uh, two years probation and uh, we call it no slip probation here. I'm not sure where they call it, you know what they call it everywhere else. Meaning one slip and uh, instead of only getting nine months, I would get 18 months. So I wasn't really too happy about that situation. Um, to tell you the truth, I'd rather have just did my time. I know out of the seven months, I probably would have only served another four and been done with it. Instead, I went through two years of probation, which was more of a hassle than anything. Now, at my sentencing, I had told my judge that the day before I had contacted a, um, a detox center, which I did just in case um, I would not be sent to prison, and that they had accepted me and offered me a chance to go there. And this is where I really emphasize to people that the system does not care about you or your rehabilitation. After I was sentenced to probation, um, and it's kind of weird to say, but at this time, you know, my addiction, even though when I came out on bond, I was really trying. Uh, right near the end of my court process, um, the stress really got to me, and I just, I, I really fell backwards and then some. And I felt sick, okay, my skin was bad, I felt like my organs weren't working, my body wasn't processing anything, and I really felt like I was dying. And I was scared, I was nervous, you know, I, I, I didn't know what to do. I had never felt like this before. I explained to my judge about the detox program and how I could go the very next day. And his response to me was, no, you are not to do that. Wait till you meet your probation officer, enter a formal request through your probation officer, they will send it to me, I will either approve it or deny it, send it back, they'll let you know, and then we can go from there. I said, Your Honor, how long are we talking? And he said, I don't know, two to three months before you get an answer. And I said, what if I'm dead by then? And his response was, I guess you shouldn't have gotten yourself into this situation. Which, okay, he's right, I shouldn't have. I shouldn't, be, I shouldn't have been in the situation to begin with, but I was in the situation. This was reality. And they claim they want to rehabilitate people. There was their chance to start my rehabilitation. So I went home. I spoke with my wife. I told her if I went to um, detox the next day, that I would pre uh, more than likely be sent from detox to rehab uh, for a number of months. But more than likely, I would be rearrested and sent to prison. And it was a real um, up in the air moment. What do you do? But we knew, uh, and she was really bad off in her addiction at this time as well. Our sobriety dates are only 11 days apart. And we made the decision that um, sobriety was more important than freedom. And because uh, either way, you know, inside or out, I wanted to be clean. You know, and I wanted her to be clean. So the following morning I would wake up and I would immediately violate my probation and go to detox. Um, I spent nine days in detox. It's only supposed to be six, but they, uh, <clears throat> they couldn't find me a rehab to go to. And they said, well, why don't you go home for a few days and we'll call you. And I said, if I go home, I'm gonna get high. So they kept me there. Um, kind of put me off in a corner. I didn't really care. Um, and they kept me there until they found me a place um, at Matt Talbot, which is in the city we reside in, actually. And the detox was at Stella Maris. So I would go to um, Matt Talbot, and I had a caseworker who immediately found out I, was, I had just been sentenced to court and sentenced to probation. And uh, she had no choice but to 
contact my probation officer to let her know where I was. I figured I had at least two or three days before I would be arrested. All I could do was try to make the most of that time and, um, you know, let, let it happen how it was going to happen. So, my, uh, my probation officer did call back and she told my counselor I will be there to see him in the next couple days. I was sitting in the room with my counselor um, during this conference phone call they had and my counselor said is he going to be arrested and she uh my probation officer said i'm not sure how i'm going to handle this yet um by the time i get there i will know so about four days went by i hadn't heard anything from her At, by this point i'm starting to physically feel a little better um i didn't want to return to jail but at the same time, if I did, at least I wasn't going to be fighting, um, you know, really bad withdrawals in jail. So my comfort level was a little bit better than it was before. And I was in a group session where my counselor would come and retrieve me and tell me that my probation officer was at the door. I, when you come out of the group room, if you go down the hallway to the right, my bedroom would be all the way at the end. Um, I asked her if she had the sheriffs with her because she's a female probation officer. The only way she could come and arrest me is if she um, was escorted by the sheriffs. She said she wasn't sure um, that she couldn't see behind the second door if the sheriffs were there or not. I said, will you please go check? And she said, yeah, I will. She went and checked. She did not see any sheriffs. She came back and told me. And I said, well, I'm gonna stand here where you go and let her in. And I could see you all the way down the adjacent hallway. And if she was gonna walk in with the sheriffs, I had it in my mind that I was gonna go down my hallway, out my bedroom window, over the fence into the woods, and um, depart the rehab. And then I decided uh, last minute, no matter what happened, I was just going to um, you know, let it happen, how it was gonna happen. Thankfully, there were no sheriffs with her, and uh, our, um, our interactions started off very bad. You know, she told me that even though I was doing the right thing, I did it the wrong way. And then she began asking me about my plans for after rehab. And I said, well, once I'm clean and secure, um, I'm gonna be going home. And she said, no, while you're on probation, you and your wife are not going to be living um, together. Now, as long as there was no restraining order, she couldn't prevent that from happening. And um, I told her that thankfully for me, she hadn't stayed in school long enough for her opinion to matter. And that's how our interactions began. Um, thankfully, that all cooled down and uh, probation wasn't hard, it was just inconvenient. But um, now looking back on it, I see it more of as a blessing because even if I did decide to slip up, I knew there would be a major legal consequence for that. You saw like you can go slip up once and you're, you know, okay, I'm done. You know, especially when you're an addict like I'm an addict. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it right. You know, I'm not going to fuss around. You know, I'm just going to go all the way. <clears throat> but, um... I spent two months and a little change at Matt Talbot, and I, even though I was very homesick, I really couldn't have visits um, from my wife because of a legal situation we were engaged in. Um, well, we actually found out later that that was not the case, but we were under the impression that it was. Uh, I was very homesick. I you can say depressed. I was on medications there um, to help with that. It didn't really help though, you know, I wanted to be home. But looking back on it now, um, those two months were really wonderful and enlightening. You know, I, I just, I learned a lot, even from other people who were there for help. You know, I seen people who came in strictly for shelter. I've seen people come in who really wanted to be there and just couldn't do it. Um, I've seen people relapse right in the building. 
you know, I had chances to relapse. Um, and I guess my willpower uh, had finally come into play, and I didn't want any part of it. You know, and I, I really did the work they told me to do. And uh, I really strongly would push going to an inpatient treatment or at least an intensive outpatient treatment to anyone, you know, going through addiction, trying to get clean. If you're not trying to get clean, I know they say fake it till you make it, whatever. I, if, you, if you're really not trying, you know, it might just be a waste of your time and a waste of space for someone who really wants to be there and just can't get the end, you know? So, <laughs> we're gonna leave the story right there, uh, me completing the, um, the nine days of detox and two months in rehab, and the next video is gonna be starting at Sober Living, which I attended for three months, which this was a real hardship. Um, just a little kind of, what do you call it, beforehand, uh, the little trailer, I guess you'll call, um, Sober Living is, uh, I went to it on the east side of Cleveland, right in the middle of the ghetto, where you find nothing but rundown projects, drug dealers, gangs, uh, the whole assortment, you know, and um, if you can stay clean there, you know, you, you can definitely uh, do it back in your world. So we're going to cut it there. Listen, like the video, uh, subscribe to the channel. We're going to try to, or I'm trying to get Vicky to tell her uh, sobriety story. She's a little uncomfortable on camera. So maybe in the comments you can kind of um, persuade her to tell her story. Alright everyone, thank you.